Alright, second try at this video. Unfortunately, the camera fell over. Go figure. Um, <laughs> kind of annoying. Uh, you know, it lost the file. So, response video to the modern mystic, essentially, uh, reaction video, whatever. Um, he made a video response to Anta Kantavad, who made a video um, basically asking a question, how do you know what reality is, or um, is there some way to qualify a claim of reality? He didn't say it that specifically, but obviously you always have to interpret what he says and put it in more specific language. Um, you know, how do we have this, how do we test these uh, theories of truth, um, reality? And, yeah, I, 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 you know, the test is, I think, one based on some sort of rational, logical, um, putting together the pieces of what makes something credible and what makes something incredible. Um, knowing that that's sort of the, the giveaway, if there's some incredible component to it, a pie you're making, you know, something that's, you know, eye of newt or something, yeah, you don't go eating that pie. Um, and there are beliefs that can be part of somebody's explanation of reality that are sort of what I would call non-starters. They're preposterous nonsense, and they ruin whatever their theory is by just being silly. And so this, the, the theory is broken by the theorem, the hypothesis that substantiates it, the evidence. And so I already made a video about evidence and how to do this thing. But all right, back to the modern mystics. The modern mystic response is interesting, three-part video. Um, you know, I don't want to just point out flaws that I saw just for no reason, but I'll point out one just to refute it in a sense. That he's, he, he, you know, he has his own interest, his own particular point of view. And uh, the peak oil thing is kind of a thing for him, the energy thing. And so he sort of implied, or basically directly stated, uh, that we'd have slavery if it wasn't for cheap energy. And we'd still have slavery because it would be convenient. Um, and, you know, I'd argue that slavery was way on its way out while people were still burning, like, whale oil and stuff. Um, you know, the industrial age hadn't really started really going yet, and people were already uh, capable of recognizing there's something fundamentally wrong with this arrangement. And I think it had more to do with the fact that this the slavery got more personal. It wasn't it wasn't industrial slavery anymore. It was household slavery in in the new world anyway. And so I would so argue for America anyway. Um, in that sense, slavery got it was easier for people. It's just like now we can accept the exploitation of uh, capitalism in the world because it is over there. It's industrialized. It's in a camp somewhere and we don't have to see it. And uh, that makes a huge difference when you're living with it, when it's right under your feet all the time. Um, I think it becomes more obvious that there's something wrong with this picture. That, um, you know, the, the balance of power is not fair. And the unfairness becomes kind of obvious and it, I think it works on people's brains. But it is, I think, a knowledge acquisition problem. Um, things were acceptable in the past purely because of ignorance. Um, people didn't know what microbes were, they didn't know what thunder and lightning were, they didn't know what anything was, so they had a, it, was, it was quite reasonable to accept some sort of mystical God theory about the creation of the universe and the creation of the world because people just didn't have any other explanation. Um, uh, the idea of evolution and billions of years and physics and all that concept, all those things just seem too wacky. You know, little particles of light and you know, all that kind of stuff. It was just not within people's grasp. And so they just didn't have an alternative explanation for their complexity, for their strangeness. Um, they thought they thought inside they didn't know what a brain was, essentially, in some respects, you know, to go far enough back. I mean, they really didn't understand the concept of brain. Um, so, you know, they had all kinds of senses of being possessed. And it does feel sometimes like you're possessed, <laughs> you know, when you're possessed by passions. Um, so those are 
rational conclusions in the environment that people lived in, um, but they weren't logical as they gained and acquired more knowledge. It became less and less um, reasonable to contrive some sort of excuse for what appeared wrong because you understood something about the mechanism. And so, yeah, we, we washed, we cleansed ourselves of demons and hobgoblins and all the really silly parts of the, um, of superstition and religion. And we gained an understanding of the mechanics and cause and effect within the mechanics. We knew that disease was an accident, not a deliberate act of punishment and all of that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, it changes the world. It changes people's perspective. And I would argue that this perspective change is progressive, that we're progressively climbing a staircase of understanding. And as you make these stairs more and more solid, um, the realms that you're able to explore um, in terms of what gets looked at um, gets deeper and finer and finer and finer, the details. You start picking at it. Um, you have the, you now have energy to pick at those things because you resolve these these big questions. So the work that was done before you, you know, provides the platform for you to do your work, your your bit of analysis from a, um, a more enlightened, a higher perspective. And I would argue that the perspective does, generally speaking, go in this progressive direction. And um, generally speaking. And we're sort of at one of those tricky times in history. There's de de definitely dark ages. There's definitely steps backward, um, you know, ebbs and tides in the flow of what dominates cultures. And you could almost argue that our culture is rather immature and vacant at the moment. It's mis you know, undirected, uh, you know, no, no clear mission statements itself for some sort of notion of selfishness is fun. <laughs> There's not much else beyond that, um, but that sort of that that could be one of these arguments that you could have about um, you know what's the right perspective on freedom, and I mean I could argue that logically and if you were to take it as a very logical and methodical analysis of uh, the cir circumstance, I think it could un be understood that um, you know this idea of freedom is very nice, but it's expensive, and um, it's going to get more and more expensive as technology gets more and more powerful. And the only way you can control the power of technology is through the users of that technology. It's going to be very hard to keep the secrets away from the people. And so you're going to have to somehow have some way to guarantee the behavior of the people. And so if you don't want any protections against human behavior, um, technology will do you in. And I think that's, th this is, so I'm just saying there's a logical answer to the question. I think there is a truth about if you have these two roads, um, you know, which one you go down, you know, this anarchy road or some sort of rational, um, you know, uh, rules-based, um, organized, structured, um, at least minimally controlled fencing of human uh, behavior. Now, if you don't realize that we do need cages, um, I think you just make this explicit logical argument that you will be done in by that uh, liberty. Inevitably. Um, the guns will just keep getting bigger. I mean, itchy and scratchy kind of scenario. And they, you will be done in by them. You'll be done in by the power of technology and its advance. Um, but anyway, it's a side subject, and uh, there's enough side subjects here. Uh, so, um, so yeah, this is a, the, the modern mystic did the, the the fuel thing as if that was an argument for um, some sort of decisive circumstance that creates motivation for people to change reality. Um, you know, if you have the liberty of fuel, then you don't need to s enslave people. And so that's always part of the agenda in deciding the credibility of a truth theory. So the previous video I did in response, I think I talked about that. But that's 
the nature of the question about the depressive angle of realism that depressives might have an advantage in terms of seeing the truth is because depression I think correlates to a lack of desire um, you know a destruction of desire it might not lack but it is it is tempered desire is substantially tempered by fear and apprehension and um, worry concern um, grief um, these things temper desire and it's in that atmosphere of a tempered desire a tempered motivation to bend the truth into something you like it to be that I would argue does provide an enhanced opportunity to see the truth um, so um, I just think it's a fact that you have to you have to consider the power these are complex things in the sense that the, the, the words we use don't aren't, aren't as opposite as we think they are. Good and bad aren't opposites. Um, in that, you know, the absence of a good isn't necessarily a harm. And, you know, the bad is always related to some harm created against some sentient. And so there isn't this reversal. And the same is true with desire, and let's use fear, or revulsion, I don't know what the right correlate would be, I guess fear, that these things aren't opposites, you know, that they have a different character. And um, again, I would argue that the component built into the mechanism that creates fear is highly rational in that the things we fear, generally speaking, correlate really quite directly to something potentially negative, so something that's going to be a real threat, and that um, the desire thing is always kind of mushy. We desire um, these ego gratification kind of things. They're not, they're not real values. So fear, you have a real, you're valuing the negative character of suffering. And desire, we're not really desiring the pleasing of something in the world we're desiring our own gratification and it's um, you know where fear is also a, a personal um, it's a personalized um, avoidance or, or apprehension about something that may happen to you so it is selfish it's not as um, well, again I, I don't know how else to put it but I think there can be a, you know, if you take to, took the time to really go through it and analyze our psychology, I'm saying maybe if you took an hour to go through it, maybe you could make it more sensible than I'm going to make it in this video. But that there is a fundamental distinction, just like there's a distinction between the fact that we value not having people being killed by earthquakes, like the suffering in the world is worth preventing. But this idea of saying, let's create living things on Mars so they can have roller coasters and go, yay, doesn't have anywhere near the same kind of power. The absent joys aren't as powerful as the, the, the threatening sufferings. And in terms of our desire, I'm just saying I think there's a similar asymmetry, a similar disproportion and that desire is incredibly corrupting and that desire is entirely arbitrary in its composition that it doesn't correlate to reality we desire things because the mechanism, our biology makes the thing desirable it makes us hungry for it oh, cat going by, There's cat politics out there um, so the mechanism is creating it and it almost doesn't matter what we desire, we'll gain our gratification. So it's like, you know, we have all kinds of different tastes in women or relationships and all this kind of stuff. And people have, can gain gratification dancing very different dances kind of a thing. And so there's no right or wrong dance. And so that's where there's a huge, um, there's, there's a huge room most people can agree that um, running a 
kid over on the street while you're on your cell phone or something is stupid thing to do. It's wrong. It's bad. Don't do that. It's bad, bad, bad. Um, so we can agree on these negative things. And we don't agree on the positives because they're all these subjective, what's your favorite color kind of bullshit. So the goods are all defined by kind of very subjective, personal conditioning that doesn't have anything to do with anything credible in the world. We're not on rescue missions in terms of our desire. And um, we're just contriving the gift kind of nature of it. We're just creating the game of, of you know, the need is creating, now, I guess all I can say is, is, is where the fear seems to have this huge logical component, there's nothing logical about the mechanism that attaches us um, to consumption and reproduction. It's just a biological mechanism. Yes, there's a correlation to the biological necessity and survival of the fittest and the whole Darwinian structure, but I just mean there's no logic built into it that these things are necessary or important by any logical standard. We don't need to be here. We don't need to survive. We don't need to win the contest. There is no victory in victory beyond the fact that our nature has made us competitive and made us hungry for gold medals, um, hungry for the win. Uh, but there's nothing, you can't logically defend the win. You can't logically make it make any sense because it's all built out of a condition that exists in you subjectively, um, personally conditioned. There's nothing logical about our pursuit, um, our hunger. It's just a mechanism where our apprehensions and our appreciation for danger is part of the logical sense. That's the secondary intellectual reaction kind of brain. It does some analysis to figure that out, where the desire is visceral, doesn't require any analysis. It just tells you, I want it, uh, I need it, I got to have it. <laughs> it just it's a straight line from your biology through the whole mechanism of your psychology where your psychology and intellect must analyze a situation to see threat and danger. It must find it. It must look for it. And through that looking process it has to apply the function of logic and that's why there needs to be a correlation to logic is because it's going through the logic system and the logic system will notice if you're afraid of something silly like I don't know the color red or whatever um, and then you'll analyze why am I afraid of that there's no threat there and you'll see that there's no threat there blah 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 that kind of logical thing will happen I'm not saying there aren't neurotics I mean there's plenty of people neurotic and they are driven by compulsive fear um, that is just as visceral as a desire. So I'm not saying there isn't a fear element that comes from biology. I'm just saying it more clearly has um, the substance of what we fear are rational visualizations of real possibilities. And uh, what we desire are completely personally constructed fairy tales of hope, <laughs> you know, of, oh, yes, I'd like to have a threesome with, and I'd like to, and they're, they're just fantasies placed on the world to say, maybe I can have that. And they don't have anything to do with any mission that has any credibility. All right, that's the, it's, 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 uh, it's all very simple when you break it down, but, I mean, it does, it's, it's complicated to get to it. You know, it's, it's probably going to be like physics. I think there is going to be a simple structure underneath it all. And if we could see it now, we could describe it very easily. But before you can see it, you're trying to describe it. Well, it's, it's just, this is just going to be banging into that because this does that and that does this. And the, I don't have a shape for that, but it's, it does, it has a shape and it makes it happen. You know, and so we, we're missing a few of these pieces of, of, you know, because we don't have a blueprint of brains 
and the stuff they make up versus the stuff they rationally discover. Um, but I guess the substance of my argument is is the the component of our our narrative um, that is large the, the the thing that makes the most errors in creating a description of reality the thing that creates the most errors in our in our model of reality in, internal model of reality is this desire mechanism that's the thing that corrupts the fuck out of it it's not the fear component or the repulsion component it's the attraction component the need component the hunger component that compels us to distort what is now become apparent I mean now the truth is kind of obvious it's this evolution thing we're just we're just machines we're replicators um, and we have these very complex instead of having just great white shark big giant mouth with teeth yeah we have very complex tools so they're not physical tools anymore they're game playing tools they're um, behavior tools so we can behave in chameleon like fashions and and pretend and and trick and play all kinds of games with Almost, it's almost like having the power of invisibility in the sense that, yeah, we can play these games that, and that's the tool. The tool is our game playing, our psychological game playing, and that's what made us strong was our, our tight family bonds, our gang warfare mentality. You know, so all the, the isms of our nationalism and nepotism and uh, racism, all of those things were the energy for our survival. And that was our tool, was having a psychology capable of creating those collectively uh, motivating sheeple style passions. Um, our capacity to become a mob <laughs> you know, was one of our tools. Cats can't become a mob. Lots of other organisms can't become a mob. Uh, but we were mobable and that was our weapon. Um, and you know, so I mean you can just do that kind of dissection and through that process it's not that complicated to explain why we are what we are and why we're having these silly conversations about a truth that's so simple we're just a chemical infestation very complex hunks of chemistry with still the basic function of consumption and reproduction and we can see that most of our psychology is sort of caught up in playing that game with this little added component of hierarchy and um, you know trying to be the winner and having some medals you know some awards and saying I'm satisfactorily functioning you know, being able to say I'm doing it right I'm successful I'm and that's pretty much all we're doing right it's, it's just not that complicated and so reality is going to get more and more obvious like that and I think it is this progressive thing there's a point where you're going to hit the plateau of all the important questions are now answered and the game is over I would argue we're already there certainly people can be there <laughs> you know um, and yeah all the questions that mean anything have been answered and um, sadly this is a game contrived by a DNA molecule and as one would expect molecules don't contrive very interesting games and it's really quite silly climb the hill fall off the hill it's just stupid <laughs> so anyway in very expensive ways fall off and very you know fall off the hill by crushing all kinds of sentience on your you know smash crush all kinds of step on all kinds of shit climbing the hill and then as you fall off the hill, crush a whole bunch more stuff. I mean, it's just waste all over the place. It's a game um, of heat, not a game of accomplishment. It's all friction. There's no function. I really like that. <laughs> yeah, it's all friction, no function.
it's all broken pieces. There's just, we're not doing anything. It's precious commodities being controlled by crude forces. It's bull in the china shop. Nothing good is going to happen. Because a DNA molecule came up with it. And DNA molecules are really dumb. So anyway, enough said. Until next time.